Right, we're in 2 Kings 19, uh, about verse 32 tonight. <clears throat> I ate supper before I came, but all of a sudden, after wrestling with Reed, I'm hungry again. <laughs> so if I come across hangry, that's just my natural state. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, we're in chapter 19. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. You remember chapters 18 and 19 are together as one unit uh, with the invasion of Sennacherib and the surrounding of the city of Jerusalem to take it. And um, so the Rabshaki, one of the generals, shows up and defies God, not just Hezekiah, but defies God in chapter 18. And then in chapter 19, Hezekiah receives word of what the meeting uh, entailed, and he uh, prays to the Lord, goes and sends messengers to Isaiah, and then Sennacherib sends a second letter to get him to reconsider, and then Hezekiah offers another prayer, and then Isaiah responds, and um, <clears throat> that brings us to verse 32 uh, of our text. So, this is actually the, the rest of Isaiah's response. We didn't quite finish it, or maybe I just mismarked it either way. So, verse 32, Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, or shoot an arrow there, or come before it with a shield, or cast up a siege mound against it. Uh, by the way that he came, the same, by the same shall, he shall return, and he shall not come into this city, declares the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake, and for the sake of my servant, David. And so, <clears throat> his... Uh, his answer and his response is the fact that you have nothing to worry about, basically. He's not even going to shoot an arrow in the city. They're not going to put their siege works up. Um, of course, uh, city walls were the major line of defense in this particular time. And they would build up siege mounds. And then, uh, depending upon which generation you're in, they're trying to penetrate the walls is what they're trying to do. They would hurl things at it. They would... Um, cast fire, just kind of terrorize the city, just kind of keep it on edge, create anxiety on the inside, and uh, hopefully eventually just break through the wall. And so <clears throat> what he's saying, though, is that not even that's going to happen, and that process can take years uh, when you're besieging a city. So uh, that's not going to happen, and God says he's going to go back home the same way that he came, and I'm going to defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And... Um, so first of all, for his own sake, this is about God showing who he is, which you remember was Hezekiah's request. In verse 19, it says, So now, Lord our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. And so <clears throat> God is acting to defend his own glory. He will not have anyone defy him. And then also for the sake of my servant David, and that goes all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter uh, 7. And the promise that he made and that he would always have a lamp in the city of Jerusalem. And we saw that even in 1 Kings uh, 11 with the removal of Solomon's son Rehoboam. And so <clears throat> God is keeping his promises. He's dedicated to his purposes. And um, he wants them to know that. It, it's interesting that um, when they're struggling and, and they're having difficulties here, God reminds them of promises. Um, it has been calculated by some, and I haven't looked at all the particulars of that calculation, how they went about it. It's been calculated by some that there are 365 promises from God in Scripture. Uh, again, I don't really know the parameters of that uh, search, but I do find it interesting that there's one for every day. And uh, that <clears throat> when we go through difficulties like this one and, and many others, the important thing is to remember promises and to remember that um, God keeps his promises and that there's an occasion, we don't have time to look at it tonight, uh, I would love to, but we just don't have that kind of time. There's an occasion in Genesis 15 when, Mo, when Abraham is doubting the promises of God and God cuts a covenant with him, and he goes through the middle of those animals. This is a one-sided covenant. It's not two-sided. It's not contingent upon Abraham. It's only contingent upon God. And what God was saying to Abraham in that covenant, if I just sum it up, is this. 
He says, if I don't keep my word to you, I'll cease to be God. I will be cut off. I will cease to exist if I don't keep my word to you. That's how sure what I'm telling you is going to happen, is going to happen. And so um, in those moments where God may seem distant, and uh, I think they probably felt that in a way here. You know, where is God? We're surrounded by all our enemies. We haven't seen deliverance yet. And uh, I think that's a common feeling. People, whether they will admit it, they have all had those feelings of, where is God? Why doesn't he seem to be listening? Why is he absent? And um, in those moments, we have to know what God's promises are and know where to turn. Because in those moments, we have this tendency to listen to our feelings. And as long as our feelings are generated and moving in our head and we don't challenge what our feelings are telling us, then the only... Basically, there's one narrative that's going on in our head. Where's God? Where's God? Where's God? Where's God? And until we insert God's side of that narrative and put a, a, a counter narrative or a second alternative into our head, that doubt is going to continue to win out. But when we meet it and we insert a promise from God, then we have something to work with. We're not just mulling over the same problem. We're actually mulling promises that speak into our problems. And uh, <clears throat> so it becomes really important on a, on a very practical level. So um, now verse 35, it's very matter of fact. It's kind of anticlimactic, really, because we've been through and we've watched all these conversations and all these threats, and it ends just like this. Like, done, gone. In just simple words, and the, that night the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. That's it. All this buildup, it was that simple. When you look at the Chronicles, the, in 2 Chronicles 32, it says that uh, the angel of the Lord went out and killed captains and leaders and mighty warriors. He didn't just kill a few of them. This is not the whole army, by the way. This is 185,000 is not the whole army by a long stretch uh, or a long shot. And so he kills the elite of the elite, your leader. I mean, he just absolutely deconstructed their army. He wiped out all of their leadership in one swoop. He wiped out all of their best warriors. And so he didn't just defeat them. He obliterated them. He hampered them for a really long time to come. Because you can't just, <laughs> you can replace certain things, and you can replace losses in leadership sometimes, but if you have an absolute wipeout in your leadership, it could take generations to replace that kind of, of, um, of disaster. So um, that's what God does to them. And then in verse 36, it says, Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria. And uh, then it says he was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, uh, and Adram Melech and uh, Sherezer, his son, struck him down with the sword, and he escaped into, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. And Esarhaddon, his son, reigned in his place. So what's interesting here is it's um, <clears throat> one of the main points that um, the king here, Sennacherib, was making and that... Um, the Rabshake made was, don't trust your God to deliver you. He can't deliver you. Well, not only can he deliver them because he does, but furthermore, the God in which Sennacherib trusts couldn't even protect him while he was worshiping in his own house of worship. His two sons killed him. That's a pretty strong contrast. Okay? God, without a problem, wipes out 185,000 of the elites. And this powerful king of Assyria can't even survive an assassination attempt by his two sons in his own God's house of worship, which was supposed to be a sacred place where his power was displayed. It's a very stark contrast to show the difference between God and false gods. So... 
this whole account is a study of deliverance, and we talked about that, deliverance and trust. Uh, especially when you go to 18 and you pay attention, we talked about the words there, especially trust and deliver, trust and deliver. And in those moments, who are we going to trust? Well, we don't live in times like this where God is going to come down and kill 185,000 people. That's not going to happen. But um, that same God is still available that works on our behalf. And he can answer the problems that we face. And that may look different uh, um, on occasion and uh, may not always be as simple as we would like it to be or as direct or as um, in that moment as we would like it to be. But he'll do it when he's ready. And uh, all right, any questions or anything on that? We're going to look at Psalm 46 in just a second, and uh, we won't spend too much time there because uh, I want to get to 20 a little bit, but just kind of hopefully be able to read that psalm a little bit better. All right, let's look at Psalm 46. <clears throat> psalm 46 is written. Uh, the historical backdrop, una almost unanimously, is that this was written after uh, a song of praise to God after he delivered them from the Assyrians who were surrounding the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so what I want us to do is two things. First, I just want us to read the words of the psalm, and then we're going to go back and we're going to see how it weaves together with our story. Okay, so <clears throat> it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, and though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, through the mountain, uh, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter, but he utters his voice and the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So, Let's try and weave these together, and I'm just going to give you quick references to passages you can look at later, um, because this is its own study by itself. So, <clears throat> with the backdrop to this, we're looking at 2 Kings 18 and 19, which we will reference. We're looking at Isaiah 36 and 37, and also 2 Chronicles 32, Okay. So God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble, or as some translations read, a well-proven help in trouble. Now, if I just read that, I can maybe shake my head based upon my past experiences and say, yeah, God has shown himself to be faithful in my own life. But if I feel the weight of 2 Kings 18 and 19 behind me, those words carry a lot more weight now. God is our refuge and strength, a very present or a well-proven help in trouble. How well-proven? He just slaughtered the most, he just crippled the most powerful army on the earth just like that. Just like that. Therefore, verse 2, we will not fear though the earth gives way. He has just shown us. When we were surrounded, all of our cities were cut off, our army was desolate, we were shut up, as Sennacherib will say in some of his writings, he had Hezekiah shut up like a bird in a cage. Therefore, we're not going to fear, though the earth be moved. We just stared down the scariest force in all the world, and God obliterated them without batting his eyes. You see, this is poetry. 
the poetic imagery, though the earth gives way. If the earth underneath my feet begins to move, God's in control of that earth. I'm not really worried about it. Though the mountains be lifted up and cast into the heart of the sea, and you can look at, uh, for verse 2, you can look at like Second Chronicles 32, 7 and 8, when Hezekiah tells them that more are with us than are with them, and not to fear because God will be with them. Second Kings 19 and verse 6, Isaiah makes a similar statement to them. So, though the waters roar with foam and though the mountains tremble at its swelling, everything around us seems to be falling apart and shaking. That's the idea. Because you've got the earth, you've got the waters of the sea, you've got the mountains, everything is trembling, everything is moving. It doesn't matter if everything around me is shaking. The psalmist is saying, I'm going to stand still and I'm not going to worry. How can he say that? He just lived it. The equivalent to that just happened. And he walked out on the other side. So, now in verse 4. There is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. In 2 Chronicles uh, 32 and in 2 Kings 18 and verse 17. You remember this meeting took place by a conduit that Hezekiah had built. An 1,800 foot conduit that took water from the Gahan Spring and funneled it into the city, into the pool of Siloam, so that they would have a water source as they were being besieged. And they would not be thirsted out, basically. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God provides for his people. He provided water for us in the midst. And water is the idea of refreshment. God provided refreshment for us, even in the midst of everything around us, was crumbling. Then you look at uh, verse 5, God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. 2 Kings 19 and verse 15, you remember when Hezekiah begins his prayer, he says what? You are God, you are in Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, on the Ark of the Covenant, you're sitting in the city. There is no way anybody topples this city with God sitting in it. And people say, well, what about later in the book when he does topple the city? Yep. But when we read Ezekiel, we learn that God has already left the city by that time. Ezekiel charts a path of God's departure out of the temple and uh, out of the most holy place and out of the temple and on to the, across the Kidron and up on to the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> And then the ascent back to heaven, which, by the way, is the same path Jesus takes out of this world. Um, And so God is in the midst of her, not moving. Nothing is going to happen. Then verse, uh, well, the last part, the second part of verse 5, God will help her when the morning dawns. Second Kings 19.35, And the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when the people arose early in the morning, behold, all the bodies were dead. God will help her when the morning dawns. They went to bed with a huge problem and woke up without one. The nations rage and the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice and the earth melts. They rage. What was the Rabshake in chapter 18 and what was um, Sennacherib's letter to Hezekiah in chapter 19? What were they doing? Raging. They thought they were just going to mow over everybody, over all the earth, including Israel. And what happened to them? God uttered his voice and it's like he melted them. He just incinerated them. Verse 7, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A fortress and a refuge are places you go for protection. And again, the Lord of hosts is with us. You can look at 2 Chronicles 32, 7 and 8 when he says this. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria and the horde that is with him. For there is more with us than with him. 
with him is the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us fight our battles. <clears throat> so then in verse 8, it says, Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations to the earth. He makes wars to cease it makes war cease to the end of the earth, and he breaks the bow and shatters the spear, and he burns the chariots with fire. And so he's in, the psalmist is, in, in essence, inviting us into understanding what God has done. And he, God literally made the war cease because Sennacherib's invasion stopped. He had eight campaigns. This was the third one. He immediately stopped it, dead in its tracks, and they went home. Then you have, he burns the chariots with fire. So they toppled, they plundered the Assyrians and burned their chariots. Now, verse 10. This is the, probably the most well-known verse of the psalm. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. Which is exactly what Hezekiah prayed for in chapter 19. Show yourself, exalt yourself in the sight of the nations. What, it's exactly what God said through Isaiah. I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of David. Be still and know that I am God. What does that mean in its context literally? Sit and look your greatest fear in the eye and watch me. Sit and look your greatest fear. Be still. And I will show you. I can do things that you cannot imagine. Your greatest fear is nothing for me. And by the way, this parallels perfectly to what Jesus does. He looks our greatest fear in the eye. Sin and death and separation from God. And he never balked. He never balked. could look at a ton of texts here, 2 Kings 19, 19, um, 19, 33, and 34, 2 Chronicles 32, 23, when all the other kingdoms hear about this, they bring presents to Hezekiah and to uh, uh, the God of Israel. Then he closes by saying, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. We don't need alliances, we've got God. And so, <clears throat> um, digging into understanding, with some of the Psalms, we really don't have an idea of the historical backdrop. But when you get the historical backdrop and you dig into them, it really enlivens the way you look at what is going on and um, the message that God is communicating to us. And... <clears throat> That God, as the psalmist says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present or well-proven help in trouble. He's proved himself. And, uh, you know, when it comes to faith or trust, <clears throat> my dad used to always have the definition, and I've remembered it all through the years, I've heard it probably a zillion times, was that faith is taking God at his word. The point being, regardless of your feelings, how you feel about a situation or even how you feel about things God has revealed and he expects of you, whether you like them or not, that does not matter. Faith is taking God at his word. <clears throat> and I think this is implied in the definition, but it's something that I've chosen to add through the years, and that is faith is taking God at his word because God has proven himself to be trustworthy. He's more than proven himself. And so... This is just one of the many occasions where when I struggle to trust God <clears throat> with a situation, I go back and remind myself of all the impossible situations I've seen in Scripture that to human eyes they were impossible, <clears throat> but not with God. And that he has never broken his promise and he's never going to. And that includes even to me. So... Um, I think we're just going to get cut off, so there we go. Um, <clears throat> this text is really, really an important one. 
uh, to return to when we're struggling with some things. And um, so hopefully, uh, no, not next. Wait. Yeah, we'll be here next week, right? 21st, yeah, okay. Getting a little ahead of myself. We'll be here. Um, and so we'll move into 20 and uh, close out Hezekiah's reign. And then we'll get to Manasseh, and he's kind of the guy that tips the scales. And uh, it won't be long. And um, unfortunately, their ruin will be sealed. But then we'll pick up in Daniel and get to see how all of it's going to change and what God's going to do. So we'll stop there, and then we'll be ready for next week.